Okay, welcome everyone to the 11 3 event, and uh, thank you for joining our session today on how Boston University uh, leveraged Red Hat's OpenShift data science to elevate their students' learning experience. Oh, yeah, you need this. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, uh, my name is Kabilan Mahendran. Uh, I lead our alliance between Red Hat and AWS. Uh, I'm the global lead, and I have uh, uh, joining me today Chuck Swoboda and uh, Frank Lavinia from uh, the Red Hat Cloud Services team. We did uh, schedule for uh, Jonathan Upavu, the Boston University professor of computer science, to join us today. Unfortunately, he fell ill, so he couldn't be here in person. Uh, but he was gracious enough to share a video with us, which we'll get to watch in just a little bit. All right, agenda for the next uh, 60 minutes. Uh, Chuck, Frank, and I will uh, cover 10 years of joint innovation and the power of our partnership. Uh, we'll follow that up by taking a quick look at the Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS, uh, as well as the OpenShift data science solution that runs on top of Rosa. Uh, and then we'll close it off with uh, a demo of the solution that was actually built for Boston University. Frank will give us that demo. Uh, and then we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. AWS was born uh, 16 years ago today. Uh, I know this is the 11th reInvent, but uh, 16 years ago seems like it's quite, quite some time away. Uh, it's considered the most comprehensive and broadly adopted cloud platform today uh, with 200, over 200 fully featured services uh, available in 29 regions, 93 availability zones, and serving in over 245 countries and territories. Millions of customers, from the fastest growing startups to the largest enterprises and leading government agencies, trust AWS to run their most critical workloads while lowering their costs, becoming more agile, and innovating faster for their customers. It's considered the most extensive product portfolio, and it's also the most secure and reliable platform that we have. Whether you're looking to deploy your applications with a single click, or you're trying to be closer to the edge, closer to your customers, with single digit millisecond latency, AWS provides you the cloud infrastructure where and when you need it. With that, I'll ask Chuck to take us through Red Hat's OpenShift. Perfect. Thank you, Kabilan. All right. So first of all, thank you all for being here for the last day of reInvent and slogging all the way down to the very south end of the strip to come hear about this. Um, so quickly, who in here knows what OpenShift is or heard of OpenShift? Raise your hands. Sweet. All right, how many here have actually used OpenShift? How many here love OpenShift? <laughs> okay, how many here don't like OpenShift? Keep your hands down. All right, who here thinks that OpenShift is Kubernetes? Come see me after class, all right. OpenShift is a turnkey application platform that is powered by Kubernetes. What we provide are level productive abstractions for developers to build, deploy, and run applications at scale. We provide an IDE, out of the box, web-based, think of it as like VS Code remote, right? Run times, right? Run times critically important, the building blocks for your applications that you all have to have, right? We're not, we're, we're not writing in C anymore, or well, some people are, but I'm not. Um, build tools so you don't have to worry about focusing on building Docker files or Kubernetes API or anything like that. CI, CD to provide guardrails for continuous in a, continuous integration and continuous delivery, observability, service mesh, a whole bunch of other things. That's the foundation, right? So OpenShift has been around, you know, what, this is the 10 year anniversary of reInvent. This is the 10 year anniversary of OpenShift. In fact, back in my younger years, believe it or not, I am old now, um, I remember Red Hat actually coming to my company and pitching OpenShift V1, right? And that was, actually it was the preview. We like to sell the roadmap here, right? And so that was in 2011, right? And it has come such a far way, right? And so it's very exciting to be here at reInvent. 
more customers run OpenShift on AWS than any other cloud, which is why we have formed such a strong partnership that Kabilan will now talk about. Thanks, Chuck. So I mentioned that EC2 was born 16 years ago and not long after we entered this partnership. So we've been in partnership since 2008 now. Uh, and I've heard a lot of stories from uh, some of the veterans that are still around, how, uh, how we've spun up RHEL 5 instances on top, of our, uh, on top of our EC2 infrastructure now 14 years ago. Fast forward to earlier this year, uh, I, I was at Boston's, uh, I was at Red Hat Summit in Boston where we launched uh, RHEL 9 support on top of EC2. But we took it a step further this time around. Uh, we didn't stop by uh, just launching RHEL on, uh, on EC2, but we went a step further and launched uh, RHEL 9 full support on our best bang for your buck Graviton instances as well. You know, up until early last year, we've had all the different flavors of RHEL, right? Whether you wanted to run RHEL servers or you wanted to put some of the, the more specialized workloads like SAP or even SQL Server, we've had full support for RHEL on our EC2, uh, EC2 instances natively on the AWS console. And over 50,000 customers trust us and put their most critical workloads on those RHEL on EC2 instances. But over the last several years, customer, customers have also been asking us to have native OpenShift support on AWS. While they, were, while they were asking us, they were also running OpenShift on EC2 even prior to any of our native support. And given the nature of our partnership, we ventured into an area that we hadn't traversed before, and that's how Rosa was born. It's a jointly managed and engineered solution, which I'll ask Chuck to tell us a little bit more about. Thank you, Kabilan. All right, so another show of hands. Who's used OpenShift V3? Brave soul, all right, V4, right? Okay, got easier, right? Actually, when V4 came out, the, v, the vice president on the product group that actually builds OpenShift, he said, this is the first time I've been able to install my own product on my own, right? And when I used to run demos, you know, I'd run these software factory demos, my, my background's in development, I would preface every time in front of customers, say, hey, I hope I sacrificed enough junior solutions architects to the demo gods last night so my demo would work. Right, on my laptop, VM spinning up, you know, a MacBook, when you run a VM in there, it sounds like it's jetting off into space, right? Well, with Rosa, no more sacrifices. Rosa just works. Rosa is a fully managed service, or cloud service, that runs on Amazon, right at OpenShift service on AWS. And what we're doing here, because it's so fully, it's fully managed and just works, really empowers developers to innovate, get there very quickly, right? It is a managed turnkey application platform, and that turnkey not Turkey, I know we're right after Thanksgiving, but turnkey application platform is critical to moving fast, right? Because when you're focusing on operations and the complexity of operations, right, you're not focusing on doing what matters most, and that is building applications for your business to remain competitive in the market, and get that value in front of your own users. The other thing is great about Rosa is, you know, this is what Amazon has trained everyone on, it's flexible pricing, buy the drink pricing. You know, Red Hat was a pioneer in terms of the subscription pricing. You buy for a year, you renew on like the proprietary perpetual licensing, right? But you know what? What about elasticity, right? One of the core values or core tenets of AWS is elasticity. With Rosa, we provide you the ability to run OpenShift elastic, scale up, scale down, as needed with workloads. And we'll see more and more of that within our Red Hat products, including with what Rosa's gonna do. We'll show in a minute double-clicking a bit, right, in terms of some of the core tenets of Rosa itself. It is a native AWS service. You can go to console.aws.amazon.com, right, and type in Rosa, and you're going to see it, right? It's right there in the console. You click, you accept an agreement, you download the Rosa CLI, and you're off the races. And we're hopefully going to have a, 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 a UI, UI experience to launch clusters very soon directly from the console, which means it's self-service, right? which means that you're 
de uh, your DevOps engineers or platform architects, platform engineers, whatever, you're, whatever the heck you're talking about, doesn't have to actually go and procure and, and spin up a bunch of VMs on their own. They just do it right through the Amazon, through their Amazon organization that they already have. Integrated support performed by Red Hat Site Reliability Engineers. Now this is the secret sauce. I know the guys out, everyone out here who's run OpenShift thinks we're really good at running OpenShift, but you know what? Red Hat runs it better because <laughs> we build it. This is all we do. We wake up every morning and think about it, right? So you have site reliability engineers in the back end who are consistently looking at your clusters to ensure that they're running the right way, right? Practically getting ahead of things before they go wrong. When things go wrong, reacting so quickly, you hopefully don't even notice, just like what Amazon does, right? This allows us to provide a financially backed SLA of 99.95%, which means if we break the SLA with you guys, we're gonna give you some money back, right? That's how sure we are of the reliability of the, of the cluster. And I'm sure there's some bean counters here in the room or those who ch write checks. Since OpenShift, or Rosa rather, is a native service in Amazon, it goes through your Amazon bill. One bill, right? Including taking advantage of your EDPs and everything else. And then finally, Comprehensive security. It's funny, on the expo floor, I think I've, no, I've not seen so many companies out there about providing security in the cloud, which is critically important. Rosa ships out of box with things like PCI DSS compliance and HIPAA compliance on the nodes themselves, right? So you can be sure and assured that what you're running is safe and secure. So, you know, you guys are probably with me, whoa, you tricked me. We were gonna talk about data science, right? And you're, all you're doing is talk about OpenShift. Well, now we're gonna, uh, switch gears a bit here because I needed to set the foundation, but let's talk about data science. So moving up the stack, because of this homogenous experience that's always up and available, we're now able to focus more on higher order services like data science, like for companies who want to become much more data driven, extract in insights out of those, uh, out of their data, provide a much more experiential experience that is powered by data. Rhodes is a cloud service that runs on Rosa that provides effectively Jupyter's notebook as a service. And most, anyone here know Jupyter? There you go, right? Anyone here like running Jupyter, installing Jupyter? No, no, absolutely not. Well, Damascus do, just like I hate installing Maven, right? Just can't stand it, right? So that's what, that's what Rhodes is. And that is what Boston University took advantage of, right? Whoa, whoa, what happened here? Oh. I didn't realize there's animation, guys. I don't like animation, so I'm clicking through that. All right, so notebooks as a service, right? This is what we're gonna show. This is what you know, Jonathan's gonna talk about here in a second, what Frank's gonna demo, right? This is what Rhodes, did, Rhodes is. Provides an out-of-the-box turnkey data science platform so that data scientists, computer scientists can focus on what matters most, and that's building those data models, that's extracting value out of the data, et cetera, et cetera. And Red Hat and AWS partnered together with Boston University to deliver this vision to the students. What we, what, we, what we effectively did was to create a data science environment that students could learn on. And I'm gonna coin it right here, trademark Chuck Sabota last, learning as a service, right? This is what we created with Boston University, right? So instead of their students having to install stuff on their laptop, they just go to a browser and start data sciencing, <laughs> right? Which is very incredibly powerful which basically turned those, those poor professors' office hours, or prevented those poor professors' office hours from becoming technical support hours, right? Bring in the laptop. And then, you know, we know in the universities now, you don't go to computer labs anymore. It's bring your own device, right? And so with this power, as long as you have Google Chrome or another web browser, you have access to roads in this environment. The other thing too, which was really interesting about this partnership, is that we didn't just focus on data science, right? We're actually able to go even lower level, so we provide a turnkey, full-fledged Linux experience out of the box. This reminds me back when I was in school, my first year, right? I had to write software in C in assembly language. I was like, what the heck? But that was just to teach me the basics, and before we got to the managed languages like Java and then eventually C Sharp and the .NET framework, right? And so he's built this full-fledged environment where they start really, really low level and then getting up to the data science experience. But you know what? Don't hear from me. Let's hear, hear from Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Um, first, my uh, sincere apologies. I unfortunately had a sinus flare up uh, and I've been asked not to travel, which is really an unfortunate thing because I was really hoping to get a chance to meet with everyone and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing here. 
Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think I'd first like to thank Hugh Brock and Heidi Dempsey of Red Hat Research, because what we've done here is a really interesting sort of synergy or collaboration between what is possible when tying academia and industrial know-how and on platforms like AWS, which just are rock solid and can scale. Uh, so I really want to thank Red Hat for helping draw this story, uh, well, going from story to something that can actually be real and that I can use and put in front of 300 students. Um, so I, let me just give you a brief uh, overview of the problems sort of we were facing, and then you know, you'll get a chance to um, see some of the demo that Frank and others have tried to put together for you. So, you know, it's it's really a fascinating world we live in when so much of computer systems that underlie almost everything we do, you come in contact as a child via things like, you know, an iPad or a smartphone. And it causes this huge schism between what your experience of a computer is and what's actually going on under the covers. And perhaps in the old days, it was sort of a very straightforward thing, right? I mean, some computer science department set up a Unix server, you got an account on it, you went to a terminal room, <laughs> talk about a distraction-free environment, and you had to write code at a command prompt. Uh, and then, you know, we evolved that to things like SSH. But really between our dramatic increase in scale, like so my next semester is 300 students. I'm trying to go from that initial sort of perception of what computing is as a software computer scientist down to how does it all really work? And this has always been a problem is how do we bridge that gap between concept, reality, and it being vocationally based on real skills. And Red Hat was, you know, has this platform, which built out of open source has constructed for data science, right? Jupyter Books and Jupyter Notebooks are really a data science platform. And some of us got the crazy idea that, hey, you know something, if you squint, we might be able to actually just turn this into a good old fashioned, terminal desktop based environment all accessible through a web browser but it's containerized secondly all the lecture material and in class experience could be on exactly the same platform because in reality it's not just the terminal server and my student experience at the time when they go back to their dorm rooms and they're hacking away at code on the other hand is like a classic sitting in the dark with a green terminal and you're trying to figure out what to do. So, and finally, of course, the final component being of that though, the necessity to scale that. So it turns out that this containerized uh, data science platform running on top of an on-demand service like Amazon really is our best of all worlds. We are back to the future. We've got a terminal-based environment to teach everything from out of real software all the way up to our lecture materials and our discussion materials and our textbook all in one place. So I hope with that, you um, get a sense of the real power that at least we've found to be leveraged from the kind of relationships we're seeing where cloud platforms are empowering not just um, someone out there on their uh, smartphone, but all the way across the stack to allowing us to educate future computer scientists. Thank you. Um, with that, we're gonna twist, switch gears, hand the mic over to someone who is way smarter than I am about this stuff, Frank Lavinia here, to talk about the architecture of what we did for BU, and then we'll do a pretty interesting demo. So Frank, 
Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, it wouldn't be a proper reInvent talk unless there was some kind of architecture slide up on the screen. Now, you can see that uh, Rosa uh, handles all of the particulars and that Rhodes is an application that runs on top of Rosa. Now, I'm a data scientist. I work for Red Hat. I, I would say I don't care about containers, but I have to care about containers now. But that's primarily not my area of expertise. I just want to be able to get to a running environment where I can run our Python Jupyter code. Although partial, I'm partial to Python myself. Um, but you'll see here uh, is that the same uh, was also true for the faculty and the students. So innovation is often blocked by just basic infrastructure, right? But what ROSA and, a and AWS can do is remove that. So they wanted to be able to support 300 students without adding any more burden to their IT administrative staff or their faculty. And that's what the power of AWS and the power of ROSA was able to do, provide a notebook environment for that many students. Now, where are my da fellow data scientists at? Raise your hand. Really? Okay. Uh, operations folks? Okay. All right, so since there's no data scientists in the room, I could say it. You're probably tired of the data science divas, aren't you? <laughs> right? I mean, how many GPUs do they really need? Are they mining Bitcoin? Like, what are they doing with all this hardware? And why are they always asking for more? Now, I get it. Data scientists have been treated with kid gloves for the last 10 years because they were very rare and special. But now, Smart applications are part and parcel of any serious enterprise, right? They're table stakes, right? I'm in Vegas, I can taste say table stakes. Um, and in order to have that, you have to have the ability to scale up and scale down. And this is a perfect situation because they were able to de deploy the solution in weeks. They were originally were very hesitant to use the cloud, but now I can say that there are now several ROSA clusters at the university. So you can see that we, you know, they, they became a believer where they can turn it up and it turns down. It scales up, scales down. So with that, I'm going to switch to a demo and I'll show you some of these courseware that they've created. So um, Jonathan is a, is, is a very interesting uh, fellow. Uh, he is the type of professor you always wanted in school. And uh, he is on a, a, a mission to open source education, right? Because the, the gating around it, his words, is really heavily monetized in terms of the textbooks and what's spent there. And by the time something goes to print, it's already outdated, right? So Jupyter Notebooks provide a, an ideal environment where you can intermix uh, text, images, even slide decks, right? So this is his presentation where he kind of uh, uh, plays it all out. I'll go down towards the bottom, and you can tell just the fact that he used this image tells you how cool his course must be, right? Because it's just like, where did that come from? Um, but basically, he talks about how Jupyter Notebooks uh, are really kind of uh, the next environment and phase for this. Now, you might have to squint your eyes a little bit. I'm afraid to mess with the, the, the Zoom too much. But he basically says, you know, is this just like PowerPoint? He goes, no, here's what makes it different. Right? If I run this code, and I can actually, honest to goodness, run that code, I am now running a terminal in a browser, right? Which I like the fact that he said we're going back to the future. Um, and as I like to say, where's my, uh, where we're going, we will need roads. <laughs> um, but that's not all. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, here's an actual lab. And it's funny because I asked him for the uh, actual real-time, access to the real-time repo. And apparently, um, there's a quiz in this, in this notebook, so he was very hesitant, which I, I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and, and from the teacher's point of view, uh, there's a couple of advantages. We already discussed how office hours no longer need to become tech support hours, but also the professor knows when you log in how much compute you used, right, and how many times you've tried. He also knows that if two hours before the assignment was due, you got it right the first time, you're either a savant or you're cheating, <laughs> right? So all that type of, th of information is tracked. Now, this lecture starts off with, with uh, assembly uh, programming language and whatnot. I got to scroll down. 
Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the particulars of this. And honestly, the last time I did assembly programming, Kurt Cobain was alive. All right? Um, so I'll go down here. And one of the key things that I wish I had as a student, I remember having to go uh, to the, the computer, uh, computer lab to get access to a, um, a uh, VT-102 terminal. And I felt like I was, you know, on top of the world when I had a modem that I could just do it from my dorm room. Uh, but what was always annoying was I'd have to read the textbook code and type it back in. That was annoying, but I'm old enough to remember Byte Magazine, right, where they'd have the programs in there and you'd have to enter that, right? But that wasn't really about learning how to code or learning how to be uh, exploratory in the environment. That was really just learning how to type. And so, you know, what you have here is, you know, you have this code here, I can run it, and that one, of course, is going to fail because demo gods. But you can see that, you know, I can interact with the code, and I have this, this live interactive service uh, surface where I can do that. Now, there's also some other interesting things I'd like to point out, um, is that uh, somewhere in this document, he refers to another course textbook, right? And if you were like me as a student, you weren't exactly the most uh, fastidious in terms of where your books were, right? Uh, or, heaven forbid, it calls back to a course you took last semester. I probably sold that book already, right? So what's cool about this is that um, I, he actually references this and uh, just links to a Git repo of this other course about geometric algorithms, right? So I did, could just do a Git pull because it's Jupyter. And now I have access to the exact same material from another course, and I can run this, and I can, I can explore this. I can obviously get a, uh, you know, integrated this. But I can also do graphs and things like that. All the power of Jupyter Notebooks that we as data scientists use it all the time. Uh, but now it's part of the education story. That's powerful. Now, for operations folks, you don't have to worry a thing, about a thing because ROSA and AWS does all the worrying for you. Now, um, since we do have a little bit of extra time, I'm going to do a quick demo on reinforcement learning. Anyone here familiar with reinforcement learning as a concept? Okay, good. We're not going to do a big treat, you know, deep dive into reinforcement learning, but I am going to do a sample of, uh, since we're in Vegas, right, how to create a bot and maximize your winnings right from that. So if you're not familiar with reinforcement learnings, don't worry. We're going to right now teach a bot how to find the best slot machine in a bank of slot machines. Um, so it's basically the idea is that you have an environment and you have an agent. That agent will read the state of the environment, take an action, and then based on the change of that environment, will either be, get a reward or a punishment. Now, for a moment, you're going to have to suspend uh, your idea of, well, how do you punish a bot? How do you publish, right? Just let that go for a second and stick with me and you'll see. Um, so ultimately, this is what they call the multi-armed bandit problem, right? One-armed bandits being the slot machines. And of course, welcome to fab fabulous uh, Red Hat Nevada. Um, so the, 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 the question we're trying to figure out here is which slot machine of a bank of five pays out the most? So I'm going to run this code and I'm going to do my imports. I'm setting up a bank of five slot machines, and what you're going to see now is what I call the ground truth. Now, this is the part where I'm going to tell you that this is a bit of a contrived example, because the odds on slot machine four are 84% of a payout. If you find this bank here for real in Vegas, call me. Let's go. Um, but you'll also see that there are some that are a little more realistic, right? You know, 0.04%, right? So what the agent knows at the start is that this is what it knows about. So I have the ground truth, and I have what the agent actually knows. So now I'm going to just kind of do the rest of setting up the simulation, right? So I'm going to have a, uh, a process where you play the machine. If you win, you get 10 coins, 10 points. If you lose, you lose one point, right? Um, so I'm going to run this now as a test, and you'll see in slot machine four, it wins nine times out of 10, which is pretty close to the 84%. And on slot machine five, where the odds are much, much worse and more realistic, uh, you'll see that it didn't win at all. All right, so how many people here are my reinforcement learning geeks? How do you, how, how do you know about Epsilon Greedy? Right, you've probably heard of that. So Epsilon Greedy is this idea of 
Do you explore or do you exploit? So you'll see this, you'll see this on the floor tonight probably, or even today, where you'll see someone playing the same slot machine for hours. They are exploiting, right? They're not exploring other machines. So there's this mathematical term called epsilon greedy. How greedy do you want to be? Which means you are either greedy or curious. And we'll see that there's a certain amount where you start getting diminishing returns as you get more curious. But now, this is the simulation code that I have that will start off with a epsilon greedy of 10%, which means 90% of the time I'm gonna stay exactly. I grew up in New Jersey, right? So I would always go down to Atlantic City and there would always be somebody uh, with a cigarette and oxygen tank. That was really the scary part. Playing the same slot machine for hours on end. So uh, with a, if, you, if that individual would only 10% of the time go through, um, this, is what the, this is what would happen. So in this example, my reward is uh, uh, 7,800. And you'll see what the bot discovered, the lower graph, is pretty close to the actual reality in the upper graph. So I'll go here and, you know, don't want to bore you, but basically if you just do the whole, I'm going to stay at one machine all the time, that's what you get, right? You, you obviously can't explore because you only know the first machine. And your reward case there is 5,200. So now I'm going to crank it the other way. Right? If I'm always going to explore, right? And you'll see that I do get a pretty good map of the land in terms of the odds, but my rewards really suffer. In fact, it's 3,600. It's the lowest we've seen now. So that got me thinking, I'll call it the Gordon Gecko hypothesis, right? What was Gordon Gecko's most famous line? Greed is, come on, everybody, good, right? Wow, going after lunch is really rough, isn't it? All right, so greed is good. So I figured, what if, right, and this is the data scientist, this is, we're very curious, and this is why we need all those fancy GPUs and all that stuff, all the reasons why operations folks don't always love us. But I'm going to do a hyperparameter sweep, so I'm going to run those simulation now 100 times, so from zero all the way to uh, one, right, with 1% uh, uh, increments, and we'll see and plot, is greed actually good? And we'll see that the plotted is on the vertical, on the height is what your reward score is. And on the horizontal is what the percentage of greed is, right? So you get um, more curious as you go to the right and you're more greedy as you go to the left. And you will see that Gordon Gecko was right, but only about if you're greedy 10% of the time. 10 to 50% is the sweet spot. Now, this brings up two things. One, this is a very contrived example. Uh, reinforcement learning requires a really good understanding of what the motivation for the agent is, right? And this is not a talk about reinforcement learning, right? But it just wants to explore to you, at no point did I have to worry about starting up a machine, starting up a cluster, right? I could go here, crank this to a bank of 50 million slot machines, right? It'll take more than two seconds, but I don't have to think about that. Rosa will handle it for me. And with that, I'll take it back to you. Thank you, Frank. All right. So we'll wrap here. I think this is the, the, the animation. Yeah. yeah. I'll go. This is the animation again. God, I hate animation. <laughs> All right. So in closing, we're going to bring up a few stats that Boston University realized after using roads on, on roads. On. One, 100% improvement in operational efficiency. All right. These are, these, again, these are stats was measured by them. And that is because they transfer the human element from the student's laptops into a centralized server, right? A centralized environment, a centralized managed service, right? And that was roads on Rosa. So they saw a dramatic reduction, which then also leads to 95% of student developer uh, setup time is recaptured. That 5% is just getting browser logins, things like that, right? And so. We didn't capture, we capture all of it because you still have a little bit of real work to do, but huge amounts of gains. And this is really important because what this does is this shortens the time from when a developer, at, or sorry, a student can start learning, can start you know, playing with the system. And then finally, this is the big one. 600% reduction, <clears throat> excuse me, 
professor's time debugging to a laptop. I think we said this several times already. These, a lot of these professors who are teaching data science, or teaching computer science, they're spending more time in their office hours doing technical support, right? That's not what you're there for, right? These guys want to teach. So what they said is like 600% less of the time they were doing tech support, which is great. That means we are really advancing learning. Lastly, you mentioned 300. They're planning to do now scale even further to more classes. So 500 students are supported by less than one FTE on this platform. So call to action, give it a try. This is what I love about cloud services. This is what I love about Rosa being a cloud service. That's what I love about Rose. Go to your AWS console. You can turn on spin up some Rosa, Rosa right now, right? It's not very expensive. Just a little bit of EC2, a little bit of Rosa subscription. Play with it, and you can turn it off when you're done, right? Also announced this week, Rose went GA, and Rose is also available in the AWS marketplace. So you can get roads to the AWS marketplace as well. So one stop shop, one bill, so you can start playing with this. Either if you're you know, teaching students, like BU example, or actually doing real data science work in terms of becoming more data driven organization. And lastly, one more information. I know there's only a few hours left in the day at the Expo booth. Please come to the Red Hat booth, or we'll stick around. Like we got extra time. We'll stick around and answer your questions. Um, and uh, thank you for coming.